Okay. So the title, like I said, Bridging Beliefs, the Lotus Sutra and Filipino Funeral Tradition. Uh, as an overview, the objectives here were, um, one, looking at understanding the key teachings of Chapter 16 of the Lotus Sutra, uh, exploring Filipino funeral tradition, and identifying intersections between Buddhist philosophies and Filipino spiritual practices. I thought it would be important to discuss the Lotus Sutra just a little bit in the beginning. And it's got some points here to, to make. One, the Lotus Sutra, as we know, is one of the most important Mahayana Buddhist texts. Uh, two, it emphasizes the ultimate reality of all beings potential for Buddhahood. And chapter 16, the lifespan of the Tathagata, a pivotal chapter revealing the eternal nature of the Buddha. Now, before we get into chapter 16, I thought it would be um, important to look at uh, chapter two, in particular, uh, Niwano's, I mean, Niwano's um, term they used called uh, root and branch. Uh, chapter two, which is uh, tactfulness, explained the real aspect of all existence. Niwano used the term root and branch to briefly summarize the chapter stating that root and branch are after all alike. In other words, this is to say that although apparent forms we see with our eyes display differences in accordance with a fixed law, root and branch, from first to last, are alike void. In my opinion, this is similar to the uh, self and no self from a uh, psychotherapeutic perspective. I'm briefly going to touch on this. Uh, you take a look at the picture on the left, a literal root and branch. All right, let's say the image is a depiction of us and we are the leaves. Each leaf vary in size, shape, and color. Also, each leaf's position, whether high or low on the tree, or facing the sun in the morning, noon, or evening, is a combination of causes and conditions, making them both alike and void. This is similar to us humans and our thinking. Observation, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, help us create our thoughts and influence our perception of our lived experiences. We willfully calculate loss and gain, cultivate unwholesome thoughts from the three poisons, and act wrongfully, thereby bringing all kinds of misery upon ourselves, like drinking poison. Regardless to our different perceptions, we are alike void or empty and the same. Just like the root and branch, there is an everlasting life force of the universe which connects us all, the eternal Buddha which is depicted in the image to the right, which starts our discussion of chapter 16 and the eternal nature of the Buddha. So some of the key teachings from chapter 16, um, I, I want to uh, discuss the parable and, and also look at what uh, the meaning behind that, that is. Uh, so one of the key teachings from chapter 16 is that the ultimate substance of the Buddha is the everlasting life force of the universe, right? none other than the eternal Buddha. Humankind and all other things are but a part of Buddha, children of Buddha, as we will see in the parable. In this way, the cold perception of the void becomes charged with human warmth as people are stirred to gratitude upon realizing deep inside that they live wrapped in the compassion of the eternal Buddha. Now, the, the parable itself I thought was very interesting, and I'll, I'll speak a little later about how I felt it related to my experiences in the Philippines, uh, especially my wife's uncle, who was the, um, so we uh, went to the funeral for. The uh, parable in chapter 16 tells of a doctor, I have known for his knowledge and skills with medicine, where he can cure any disease. Uh, the doctor has many children, and once when he has to go away to attend some matter in the absence, the children drink some of his poisonous medicine. Such an event would never have happened if he had been home. But children would be children, and this is the result. So as the poison begins to work, they throw themselves around the ground in agony, and at this point, the doctor comes home. He, some of the children are not so badly affected, but some are completely out of their minds. Still, they are overjoyed to see their father again. 
They welcome him home, tell him how foolishly they have been, and beg him to cure them to save their lives. The doctor at once sees their, their state and sets out uh, creating um, a cure for them using herbs and a pleasing color, taste, and smell. Right? He gives them to his children and promises them that it'll take away their pains and cure them. The children who are not so badly affected and have not lost their senses take the medicine and are immediately cured. But the ones in whom the poison has worked deeply will not take the medicine they have begged for. Being out of their minds, they do not like the color and the smell and will not take it. And the physician sees that he must take extreme measures now, and his poor children are to be saved, for the poison has now completely overcome their senses. He then gathers his children together and tells them that he's, gonna, he's getting on in years and he's soon going to die. Still, he has affairs to attend and must go away. He leaves the medicine that he prepared for them and urges them to take it. With this, he sets out and has not gone for so long that he sends a servant back uh, to tell the children that, that he died. And the, the children are shocked and thrown into sorrow at the sad news. For the first time, they keenly feel their desolation and the shock restores their senses. The medicine their father has left for them seems pleasant now and smells, smells better. And they swallow it down and are promptly cured. At this point, the father that they all thought it was died comes home and lied and well. And this is summarizing the, the parable, of course. Uh, but the doctor in this parable is uh, the Buddha, the children are us, and the poison is the various desires, and the medicine is the teaching of the Buddha. Now, the meaning behind uh, the, the parable, a couple of points here I want to, to make. One, we are all subject to all kinds of desires. I do partly to thinking that only what we can see with our eyes really exists and that what we can't see doesn't. Examples include money, material things, as well as all events occurring around us as things that really exist. Shakyamuni Buddha taught that all visible or apparent forms in the world are but temporary appearances brought into being by combinations of causes and conditions. If these causes and conditions did not exist, neither would those visible forms, visible forms. On the basis of this truth, he spelled out various doctrines, including the Four Noble Truths, the, the Eightfold Path, and the Six Perfections. So these teachings were uh, something that enabled many to set aside the delusion and attain a peaceful state of mind. Yeah, I think it's important to, to take note here, is, you know, why was this important for him? And, and this is where I said, again, it kind of relates to my experience in uh, the Philippines. Uh, Shakyamuni was concerned that when he's gone, that many ordinary followers will revert back to what they were before. And through the parable of the poison children, he made clear that the Buddha exists forever and is imperishable as the life force of the universe was and always will be at hand. So just as the children in the parable in the father's absence, in the father's absence they did as they pleased and brought pain on themselves by inadvertently taking the poison. So other living beings in absence of the Buddha in person have brought on suffering onto themselves by living as they please. In the parable, the father returned from the dead, so to speak, when he came home, and even the children who, like people, swayed from various desires, had lost their sense from poison and were overjoyed to see him. They were like anyone, for however far one may stray from the path, in humanity's hearts of hearts, the Buddha nature remains intact. The Buddha, like the physician's father, compounded a variety of precious medicines. Right, a medicine that put aside delusion, a medicine for gaining true wisdom, a medicine to awaken a spirit of dedication to others. There were some who accepted them at once and were thereby saved, but there were numerous others who paid no attention and would not touch the medicines left alone. Being out of the senses, they found no virtue in them, mistaking their fragrance for stench and the color and taste for something foul. They would not touch them but they were infatuated with the pleasures of various desires. For them, the teachings of the Buddha were cramping. 
and they have no wish to listen to them. To them. This is, in a way, a shallow, humankind, selfish way. The Buddha then resorted to an extraordinary device to open people's eyes. He hid himself for a time where he could not be seen. And I think it's important also to note that the ultimate substance of the Buddha is eternal, imperishable life force, and the Buddha abounds within and about us all. We ourselves are in one substance with the Buddha. Like with the example I gave of the uh, root and branch. If we have a deep awareness that we are animated by the Buddha, the life force of the universe, that we may live always with the greatest confidence. Right? Whatever pangs of life there may be, it will be as though they actually did not exist. This is the true way to live as a human being, and I believe this is one of the great lessons of this chapter. So, from uh, the key teachings here in Chapter 16, I want to uh, switch gears to Filipino funeral traditions. Uh, the photo in the picture here is uh, from the service. Um, it's actually in my uh, mother-in-law's home. And uh, I'll read a little bit about what traditional um, funeral uh, settings look like. So in regards to, to my experience, my, my family in the Philippines is from the province of La Union. Uh, Bawang is the, the city. Uh, and it's, uh, that area is mainly Catholic. Uh, they practice the, the ideologies concerning death and conduct their funeral services in accordance to Catholic theology. Uh, the basic format of death rituals there and celebrations include wakes, vigils, burial, a nine-day novena, 40th day, and a death anniversary. The, uh, the wake, regarding the wake, the body is prepared and laid out in the home that's pictured here. Uh, it's adorned with flowers, and the flowers were beautiful. Um, and it's, the picture doesn't even do justice to the, the size of everything. Uh, there's candles, um, lighting, and um, a, a veil kind of that goes around. One thing unique uh, I found with the, the setup, I guess you can call it, is that the, the casket is always open, and uh, the casket has a, uh, a glass over uh, the the uh, the uh, remains, and um, so everyone can see the uh, the, the person. Uh, the, just uh, as an added point, when uh, my wife's uncle passed away, we there was a funeral in Canada where he passed away, where he lived, and then there was one in the Philippines. In both places, the setup was the same. Um, so regarding the wake, the body is prepared and laid out in the home. I guess in this picture here, family members do not work or participate in activities during that time. And that was my experience. Uh, family members didn't work. They didn't participate in any activities aside from providing refreshments to people who came to uh, pay their respects. Uh, the wake can last anywhere from three to seven days, uh, which allows family and family, friends and family to say their last goodbyes. And during the time of the wake, the nearest kin is expected to sit beside the body in order to receive contributions uh, from the visitors. In return, the family in mourning is expected to prepare food and refreshments for the guests. So like I said, the only thing I've seen them do was prepare uh, refreshments. Uh, the, the wake lasted, it was seven days. Seven days it lasted there. and. Um, uh, the other piece of it too was for once the body arrived, 20, uh, 24 hours somebody had to be there with the body to accompany. Them. So we would take turns. Different family members would sit in and um, spend time with uncle. Uh, my mother in law was the one who spent most of the time during the day in terms of greeting. Uh, visitors who uh, came. 
the the nine day novena uh this actually happens it can happen during the same time uh it, that's a what it is is they have prayers every day um in the afternoon and they can have a celebration in the evening where people can share stories about the um the the uh the uh disease. Uh, the folk belief regarding the nine day novena is that the soul leaves the body on the ninth day. And the 40th day observance is that they believe that the spirit enters uh, the spirit world on the 40th day. Uh, now, mind you, there are other Filipino uh, practices, burial practices that are observed. Uh, some they they did there and others they didn't. Um, one of the ones they, they did do was once the body leaves the home for the funeral, no one enters the home. And then another tradition um, is uh, for the mourners to walk behind the coffin. So once they load the, the coffin on the vehicle, uh, the one lines up behind, and, and we basically follow the um, the vehicle to the uh, church. Uh, I was in line, but I, I had my son who's a year and a year old, and um, it was pretty hot. And and my father-in-law uh, picked us up, and we drove most of the way, so we we didn't actually walk the entire way there, uh, but many people did. Uh, and once we got to, so after the church service, um, there's, it, there was a mausoleum that was built uh, during his lifetime where most of the family members um, are, are laid and um, he was uh, placed there. Uh, another thing too to mention is that um, the morning uh, normally is for six weeks. And um, one of the ways they identify that someone is mourning is they would they would uh, give them a black bar pen. So I have a black bar pen that I was uh, given at the beginning, and uh, many people wore it during that time and even afterwards um, as a as a sign that that they were still mourning. Um, now regarding the the mourning too, you know, even though it's it, you you still will see people mourning there, even though there were. Um, there were activities, uh, I would say, during 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 the day. There was, I uh, was well, not saying during the day, but at night. Um, we actually had a band uh, that came in the evening, and um, they played different songs. They they played songs by request. Um, played a lot of Journey. That was um, a group he liked, and. Um, a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, a lot of drinking, uh, gambling, uh, eating, and it, it was uh, a lot of telling uh, stories of Uncle, and and, it, and you get to hear different aspects of his life and how he, uh, I would say, helped certain people on their trajectory, and and I thought that 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 was uh, you know pretty in, insightful in how a guy could touch so many people in so many different ways without necessarily knowing them all, but he seemed to have a lot to offer from looking at things from a, as, as a whole. Um, but I, like I said, getting into um, Filipino funeral tradition. Now, from here, as you look at Buddhist philosophies and Filipino traditions, there's three points here that that I that would that come to mind for me. One is ancestral veneration, similar to Buddhist practices of honoring the deceased and recognizing their continuing influence. Like I guess that 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 seemed to be a common theme there. Um, there was nothing but positive things said about Uncle, and like I said, a lot of what was said were things that seemed to really affect people in their trajectory in their lives. Uh, community support. Both traditions emphasize communal support during mourning, reflecting the interdependence taught in Buddhism. Uh, there was a, a lot of of um, 
the community seemed to support the 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 um, the entire funeral. Really, like in the morning, there was a a guy in a in a, in a bread truck that came and. He would give free bread to us because uh, he knew that we have like an on and that let you know that he passed away. And uh, yeah, people that came by to bring different um, meals and stuff, snacks. Um, different people just came to uh, support. They sat out front and you know they watched. They had like a, a movie or a, a video rather of uh, Uncle's life. And he had people that was telling stories and people that was there listening to it who I didn't think really knew him, but because they're part of this community, they were there to support. And a cyclical view of life and death, resonance with the Buddhist understanding of samsara, in terms of uh, birth, death, and rebirth. And um, like I said, a lot of what I was hearing from people wasn't so much uh, uh, sad, but more so celebration in terms of um, continuing things that he started. So much so that our the family that, that, that's in Canada where Uncle lived at, uh, this was their first time traveling to the Philippines in maybe 15 years. And one of the things he really wanted was for them to visit there, including his brother. And um, once they did, that seemed to really have an effect on them and that they wanted to spend more time there. They wanted to embrace the Filipino culture more, especially their, their hometown there, where people are looking at visiting more, maybe even uh, purchasing property there to, to live at when, when they retire. So, you know, he kind of knew what he was doing, I would say, you know, er earlier on. Uh, and I should also add that part of the reason all of us were able to go was because in his will he set um, aside money from his uh, pension for everyone to travel there. So he wanted everyone to, to go there to um, experience this. So intersecting values. There's three points here that come to mind. One is compassion and empathy. This is the both Buddhist teachings and the Filipino approach to mourning and support which I believe I talked about, spiritual liberation. Although conceptualized differently, both traditions hold a belief in some form of liberation of transcendence beyond the physical death and the role of rituals. In both contexts, rituals serve to honor the deceased, providing comfort to the living and affirm spiritual beliefs. Um, especially when it came to, like I said, the 24 hours that we had to sit uh, by the, uh, the, the casket, that was... Um, uh, insightful for me uh, because it was something that um, I haven't practiced uh, and, and just seeing that this is something that is common here uh, really kind of made you reflect back on things in terms of life and death and just how cyclical it is. So I, I, I feel it's almost like built in, so to speak, uh, these Buddhist uh, values and, and how they uh, seem to align with each other. So I have some discussion points here I thought maybe might be of some interest to discuss, one or maybe two of them. Uh, the first one is, how can the eternal perspective of the Buddha's life in Chapter 16 of the Lotus Sutra inspire us in our approach to death and mourning? And two, in what ways do Filipino funeral traditions reflect the universal quest for meaning, remembrance, and spiritual peace? We'll come back to that later. But uh, as a conclusion, uh, I have three points here. The integrated teachings, the Lotus Sutra's message of eternal life and universal Buddhahood offers a profound perspective on mortality and spiritual continuity. Shared humanity, despite cultural differences, the universal theme of compassion, mourning, and quest for spiritual understanding binds us together. Ambitions, we deepen our own spiritual practice and foster a more compassionate world. And like I said, for me, uh, this topic seemed to deepen my own spiritual practice. And um, it, it seemed to help me see what what I see and tend to see in other areas. And I think it's 
if I could do that with that, we could do that with almost anything else. Uh, now we can open the floor for questions, uh, reflections, or anything like that. And then thank you for participating in this and hope we continue to learn and grow from each other, you know, on our spiritual journey. I'll stop the share and then, or actually, I'll go back to the questions if anyone wanted to answer that. So, why don't we begin? Uh, Itsushima Sensei, do you have any comments or, or questions you would like to ask? Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful uh, topics. And uh, uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, Filipinos funeral service, etc., uh, based upon the, the Lotus Sutra. And in Japan, we do that the wake in at the on the day of week evening, uh, we chant uh, the Amitabha Sutra, and the following day uh, funeral service. We mainly based upon the uh, uh, the Lotus Sutra, and you discussed the very important part of the Lotus Sutra, uh, chapter two, skillful means, and chapter sixteen, eternal uh, life of Tathagata. I think uh, these two uh, represent the elements of the Lotus Sutra. And I'm very glad to hear that uh, you follow the life the Tathagatas and based upon the Lotus Sutra. And, uh, and, and after the funerals, uh, the ashes will be buried after 49 days after uh, the, uh, uh, the person who passed away. And uh, so, uh, according to the tradition of Buddhism, 40, during 49 days, uh, the spirit remains uh, at their home and then uh, leave the spirit to the uh, canon, uh, Avalokitesvara's place, uh, uh, etc. And uh, so this is uh, just uh, Japanese tradition of the uh, funeral service. And I, it, it was very interesting uh, to hear such a tradition you have it in Filipinos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you. I don't really have very much to say about it, except it was very interesting. And I think that the um, one of the things I was I was thinking about was how similar the Philippine um, funeral the preparation for the funeral and the way that it's carried out. I see so many other cultural elements in there. Mm. For instance, from a Victorian perspective, you stayed by the body because there was always the, the danger that a person would have been declared dead um, prematurely. And so they stayed by the body for seven days quite often. The reason the casket was open was so that they could see if the person moved. Mm. Uh, that's where that whole idea of the open coffin came from. And, uh, but then on the other hand, you sit for a shiva for seven days <laughs> with the people not doing any work except taking care of, you know, refreshments and that sort of thing in an Orthodox Jewish uh, household. But that's, that's after the burial because the body has to be buried in seven days in Judaism. But so you see so many different elements that probably came from um, Philippine folk culture, but then it mixed with um, Spanish culture when the Spanish came and they would have brought some of those other customs with them. So it's really fascinating. And then I think that your reference back to chapter 16 is really useful because in that context, the uncle was in many ways, rather like the, the, the Buddha, knowing what the children were going to do. And so he provided a mechanism whereby the children would be taken care of and encouraging them to 
visit their hometown and, and doing that sort of thing. So he realized that after his death, he still had a purpose. By the way, that's called karma. <laughs> so thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much, Newmont. It's very, very elucidating. So I'll open it up to other people to ask what questions they might have. And I'm going to stop the recording really quickly. Okay.